There's a very short chapter in the book, uh, Open Heart, Clear Mind, on the topic of close-mindedness. And I was exploring this chapter together with some friends from Brazil in an online study group. And kind of following up from Venerable Semke and Venerable Samton's uh, talks the last two days, I thought it was an apt topic to consider on close-mindedness. So when I was talking to the study group, um, it brought me back to a time in my life when I really should have been the most open-minded. You know, I was in my early 20s, I was starting college. That's the time when you're supposed to, do, to be curious and open to new ideas, right? But when I look back, I think that was probably a time in my life when I was the most close-minded. <laughs> and um, I had come to the US uh, to study, and it was, I think, shortly after 9-11. So the US had begun its war on terror, and I had very strong views about that. Uh, I had to weigh up, you know, like, what does it mean to study in America? <laughs> Is it ethically sound? <laughs> and shortly after arriving, one of the first things I did, of course, after buying bed sheets, setting up my room, walk to the theater department and sign up for auditions. What else are you going to do with your life, right? Um, and I saw a big flyer there for a production of Lysis Strata. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Yeah, it's a play about women who refuse to have sex with their husbands until they stop fighting. It's a Greek play. And uh, it was a protest against the war. And it was uh, they were organizing a stage reading. So of course, I immediately signed up for that. And that you know shapes like the beginning of my life at college. So. I met all these people who, you know, were off, who were like-minded and so on. Those were the first friends I made. And at the same time at school, we also had like a residential advising group. So all the people who live in the same building have like an advisor and you meet to eat pizza together and talk to the same advisor about your problems or, or you know, it's like a social group to make sure you know people. And in that group, there was a young man who was getting a lot of attention from the ladies because he was very good looking. And also, as um, the word had it, was, you know, the son of a politician and came from a wealthy background. So, you know, he was someone who stood out in the group. So one day I happened to be in a study space and I found myself sitting across from this young man. Um, and so we struck up, you know, and we're in the same group, right? So it's like, okay, there's an opportunity to have a conversation. So we just started, you know, with some small talk, and I talked about how, how I was part of this theater production against the war. And he just, like, had this look. <laughs> and he started to express his views about the war, about how, you know, it's the patriotic duty of Americans to stand up against terror and how he felt it was totally the right thing to do. And I have a memory of like, it felt like time stopped for me. I sat there, I was like, huh? how could someone possibly be saying those things? You know, I genuinely could not believe, like, how could you even think in this way? You know, it was like, huh? I just really didn't know how to respond. And I'm guessing he had the same feeling toward me, like, what are you doing performing in this play about the, what? It was a really awkward moment. And two of us just kind of sat there, and the conversation just ended right there. Like, we just decided not to continue talking about this. And I will say I never, ever spoke to him again in those four years. And when I look back, it's something I really regret. You know, like, that was a small opening, and immediately I was like, you think the wrong thing. <laughs> I don't even want to interact with you. It was so, like, the door has closed, and... Yeah, and I, I'm, of course, for the next couple of years, I just surround myself with people with the same kinds of views about the war, about politics, and imagine that I'm getting a very diverse education. <laughs> you know, so it's very sad to look back on that and, and kind of, that was a really close-minded moment. Um, and I will say throughout college, I might have, I might call myself a totalitarian liberal, as in everybody should be liberal. Everybody should be progressive, okay? And I will talk to you until you believe me. Um, to digress, I will confess that when I watched Barbie the movie on the plane, one of the mo why I enjoyed that film so much, I, yes, I confess that, was there was a moment that was like my own fantasy come true, right? Where um, there's a moment where I think Barbie world is about to be taken over by patriarchy. And the plan to save the Barbies is to kind of kidnap them 
from, um, you know, they've lost all autonomy and they've become waitresses who give foot massages. So they get rescued by being kidnapped from their situation and put into a little trailer and someone like reads them the feminist manifesto. You know, it's like telling them all the contradictions of patriarchy and immediately they like get awakened and resume their former intelligent feminist selves. And that's really how I thought you could change the world. You know, if you just wrote a good essay or like, you know, read it to people and convince them of your view, they would be converted. Yeah, you just had to kidnap them and put them in a trailer and read it to them. So, you know, so just looking back on this, I realized, yeah, that, I mean, obviously that is just not how you change the world, right? It has to happen with even just looking at your own mind and recognizing what's going on in it. And that took me a very long time to come to. And so, yeah, Venerable Samden's talk yesterday really resonated with, with me because it reminded me of how if you just even have this thought the other person is wrong or they need to be converted in some way, it's like the door is closed. Yeah, you, you can't even, it's not even about getting to a point of agreement. You know, you're, you're trying to change the other person. Um, and in, once you have that in mind, then it's very difficult to even listen to them or to really just have an open mind. And I will say I'm very far from that <laughs> at the moment. You know, I'm still very ingrained in certain views, uh, but it is definitely something to keep working on. And another thing that surprised me that I read recently uh, was that this doesn't just apply to how we relate to others, but it applies to ourselves. Um, and in the study group too, there was one person who talked about close-mindedness uh, toward themselves like refusing to accept a health situation they were in. They're just having like, no, I'm not aging. No, I'm not going through this. No, 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 no. And it's like, it's happening, you know. <laughs> this is just the nature of this body. It's changing. And she realized like the more she was resistant, refusing to accept what was happening, uh, the suffering just increased. So I happened to read this quote um, through like an email kind of publicity thing where it said, don't meditate to fix yourself, to heal yourself, to improve yourself, to redeem yourself. Rather, do it as an act of love, of deep, warm friendship to yourself. In this way, there is no longer any need for the subtle aggression of self-improvement. Instead, see meditation as an act of love. And at first I was like, mm, is this some kind of touchy-feely, whatever, <laughs> right? But I checked out who gave the quote. His name is Bob Sharples. Uh, according to Wisdom Publications, he has been a longtime student of Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopa Rinpoche and uh, practices and teaches meditation. And so, yeah, that quote really caught my mind because for sure there are days where I'm meditating to fix myself, <laughs> right? Like something's deeply wrong with me and needs to be fixed. Like, but, you know, not from a recognition of this is the suffering of cyclic existence, but like, I got to push myself in some way or, you know, some things needs to be, yeah, like, like this kind of attitude. Um, and that actually does not work. <laughs> it's a kind of violence um, that really hit home too when I read a reflection by one of my uh, Shravasti Abbey Friends Education program participants who said, um, Reflecting on this topic of suffering, she said, meditation has not relieved my suffering. And she said, why? Because I go to it with this attitude of, I must sit. You know, I'm just going to push through. It doesn't matter. I just have to sit. She said, I've, I've sat for so many years, and I think I've brought myself more torment. And she said, for the first time taking the safe course, I asked myself, what is happiness? Have I ever experienced it? Or what are its causes? And that is the beginning of love right, because you need to understand what happiness is in order to wish it for yourself and others. And that doesn't come from like that, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, when we're close-minded, when we have some very fixed ideas about what is right, what is wrong, yeah, what is good, bad, what needs to be fixed, what is, needs to be healed somehow, um, we're actually just stuck in that kind of very narrow mind. And it amazes me that what the Buddha taught, this framework of the four truths, uh, begins with kind of opening up, you know, opening the mind to recognize. The first truth of dukkha is to be recognized, not to be resisted or not to be, I don't know, held up as a goal or whatnot. It, it's the first step. It's just to pause and open the mind and recognize. 
this is not satisfactory. If this is not satisfactory, is there something satisfactory? Hmm. <laughs> And next, to look at the causes of that unsatisfactoriness. I don't know, the movement, the mental movement of that just seems very different to me uh, than, a, than a kind of push, fix, something needs to change kind of, yeah, I don't know. I'm still working this out, so maybe the right words are not coming. But yeah, this process of discerning, okay, this is unsatisfactory, then what is happiness all about? Um, how can I recognize yeah, how that plays out in my experience. And more importantly, when I meet with you who has very different views about anything, how do I recognize that you are going through exactly the same thing? Right? That you too are suffering, that you too want happiness. Uh, we have very different ideas about what that looks like or how to get there, but how can we at least uh, begin by listening to each other? Yeah. So yeah, I guess as Venerable Sampton already said yesterday very beautifully, it starts with listening to ourselves, with identifying where our heart is closed and how to begin to open that uh, before we can even begin to listen to someone else and understand what makes them suffer and how to bring about happiness for all of us. <laughs>